Okay? And we said that, you know, in the very early part of uh, the development of microeconomics, economists argued that there has to be a way we can quantify satisfaction. Because satisfaction is at the heart of our consumer's buying decision-making process. Our buyer buys things because these things make him or her happy. So we need to have some kind of way to measure happiness or utility or satisfaction. Let's forget the word utility. Satisfaction. Now, from the onset, people realize that this is not a trivial task because happiness is basically a relative concept. Uh, there cannot be an absolute measurement like meter or liter or kilogram. These things that I just gave reference to are various units of measurement, various units of measuring <coughs> physical things. Uh, distance, weight, but can you really measure satisfaction or happiness in the same way? The answer is clearly no. And over time, there has been a lot of debate. And over time, uh, economists have argued that and, and have sort of uh, you know, reconciled the fact that util uh, satisfaction <coughs> probably can only be compared between two individuals, between groups. But that's a little bit advanced topic. And some of you who will take intermediate micro or some more advanced economics course will probably see that. In this course, in this chapter, we are going to make <coughs> simplifying assumptions. We are going to stick with the assumption that there is probably a way we can measure satisfaction or utility uh, or happiness. And we are going to introduce this concept, a unit of measurement that measures <coughs> satisfaction or happiness. It is called util. Uh, named, uh, you know, this idea was coined by Marshall about 200 years ago. And he said that util should be a unit of measuring satisfaction. So just like you measure distance, you should be able to, uh, you know, use util to measure your satisfaction. So with that, with that, we can now formalize a way to understand how a consumer makes his or her purchasing decisions. We will immediately start talking about something called marginal utility. But before that, I'd like to answer your question. So what's wrong with just using basic price as a measure of satisfaction? There's a problem with that. Uh, first of all, by now you should realize that price is a very complicated mm -hmm. thing to understand, right? For example, imagine that you live in a desert, right? You live in a desert and you have very scarce quantity of water available, and the price of water is extremely high in the area that you live in. As opposed to that, imagine that you live in a village close to which there is a water well, from where you can basically get the water for free. So you notice that the price of this water is basically a relative measurement of the scarcity of this water, right? So it is very difficult to use price as a way to figure out your level of satisfaction, which, by the way, is done in practice. In practice, if you really want to get an idea about consumers' purchasing decisions, we, will, we can use price as a way to indirectly understand how the consumers make their decision, which is based on something called indirect utility function, a fairly sophisticated concept, but your intuition is well taken. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good question. Uh, but for this course and the, for the level of discussion that we're having, price is not a good way to go. So we are trying to introduce the classical ideas that economists before us really you know, talked about. And obviously, they were uh, abandoned at some point of time. But this idea of util, if you can digest that idea, if you can accept that this is a way you can literally measure satisfaction, could be a major vehicle through which we can explain to our undergraduate students as how the consumer carries out their complex purchasing decisions. Because purchasing decisions are fairly complex. Okay, so if we believe utility is, util is a way to measure satisfaction, then marginal utility um, will be a way to figure out how much extra satisfaction a consumer gets 
by buying one extra unit of whatever he is buying. Okay? This will have very close similarity with some of the stuff that we have looked out before. Okay? We have used the idea marginal before. We have looked at two important concepts that talked about marginal. One was this idea of marginal cost, another one was this idea of marginal benefit. After exam number two, uh, we are going to cover four chapters related to market and you will see that this idea of marginal becomes a central figure in that discussion. So the idea of marginal is kind of important because we have learned at the very beginning of this course that consumers also always think on the margin. Whenever they are trying to make a decision about whether they want to undertake an action, they consider and calculate the marginal benefit of that action and marginal cost of that action. They compare these two numbers or concepts and then they undertake certain action. So in that same vein, we can argue that marginal utility will be the number that our consumer is going to look at when he or she is trying to figure out whether he or she is going to buy one additional unit of the things that she or he needs to buy from the market. So we want to be consistent with our uh, idea of rationality that we introduced at the very beginning of this course and we want to be consistent with the idea that every consumer think on the margin. With these two ideas, <clears throat> let us now try to see how marginal utility derived from this concept of utility uh, or util can be a good way to understand consumer behavior. When I talk about utility, when I talk about satisfaction, uh, I always, uh, you know, come up with an, uh, like one of my examples that I have been using for a long time, which is this idea of a person going to a marketplace and buying oranges. Oranges, very simple idea, very, you know, a very basic fruit. Imagine a person is going to a marketplace uh, at the beginning of an orange season, which is probably kind of strange for you guys because you can buy orange throughout the year. But there are countries where you can buy only orange for a couple of months. And I am from one of those countries. Okay, so let's say that's the, you are going to a marketplace, uh, you know, at the beginning of a season, and you are seeing all these oranges, and you're very excited, right? And you're buying some oranges, so the question is, uh, you know, how much are you going to be willing to pay for those oranges at the beginning of a season? Now, it's a, the question is a relative question, right? So what do you mean by how much? That's, we haven't really resolved that. But we can argue that at the beginning of a season, you are probably very excited about buying oranges. And if you are very excited, if you feel like this orange is going to make you very happy because you are you know, eating it for the first time, you probably will be willing to pay a very high price for that. That was, that will be part of a discussion later on. But I want to focus on the idea that when I am buying the first orange of the season, that orange is going to give me a lot of happiness and satisfaction. And that makes sense, right? So I am, I am excited for the first orange, uh, you know, and if I can really obtain that, it's going to make me happier. It, will, it's going to, it is going to give me a lot of happiness. But as I start buying more and more oranges, will I be equally happy? The answer probably is no, right? And, and the book, the chapter talks about a pizza example. It's the, it has the same interpretation, but I always like the orange example because orange has the problem that if you eat too many oranges, you start becoming unhappy, right? Your stomach starts, you know, not making sense. And so when you are talking about orange, as you buy more and more oranges, you are going to be less and less happy, right? So your satisfaction that you get from each additional orange starts going down. Make sense? And this idea is, sim is very much similar to something that we saw before, where we can talk about this idea of law of diminishing marginal utility, where, um, which the law of diminishing marginal utility um, is very much connected with the law of demand. We really, we really never connected the dots. So let me try to sort of give you an idea, and we're going to stop there. 
uh, a, a major part of this chapter is going to talk about how utility concept, the concept that we are dealing with, can help you to understand the shape of the demand curve. Uh, I haven't really decided whether I'm going to include that in this chapter. If I do, it will be discussed after the exam, not before. But imagine, uh, if you remember the law of demand, you know, you, you, so imagine that when the price is going down, you're buying a lot of uh, you know, goods, and when the price is very high, you are only buying a few, right? Uh, let's, let's sort of switch that idea and, and see whether you know, we can make, a, make the argument as follows. Can we make the argument that when I'm buying my initial goods, my first unit or the second unit, I'm willing to pay a very high price? as opposed to when I'm buying the 10th unit. Does it make sense? Do we all see that uh, the reason why uh, we are buy, pay, willing to pay less for more is because we are not happy with more. We are happy with less. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Okay. The law of diminishing marginal utility makes the same statement in a slightly different way. It argues that as you buy more and more, the extra utility that you get by buying of each additional unit starts going down. So, in a minute, we're going to look at a graph called marginal utility, <coughs> and we're going to see that the shape of the marginal utility curve really mimics the shape of the demand curve. Okay? <coughs> so, law of diminishing marginal utility, there is a definition. The definition will be in your exam uh, in some formation. The principle that consumers experience diminishing additional satisfaction as they consume more of a good or service during a given period of time. So that's a very straightforward, simple definition of law of diminishing marginal utility. This is a very, very important concept. Now, as I mentioned that this is basically an analytical chapter. The ideas that we are introducing are fairly uh, cerebral in the sense that you really need to understand them. But, you know, for undergraduate students, numbers always help. So imagine that this is an artificial example where uh, you, uh, for each slices of pizza that you buy, uh, you are given some uh, you know, arbitrary numbers that sort of represent your total utility from that pizza. Okay? So when you buy one, zero, no utility. When you buy one, your utility is 20. When you buy two, your utility increases from 20 to 36. Uh, when you buy the sixth unit, your utility is 51. So first of all, notice that as you buy more and more slices of pizza, your utility is sort of going up. Something that I hope that you will remember for your final exam. Because we are going to st start talking about stuff from the production side, which looks exactly like this. So if we plot our total utility, uh, where the vertical axis measures utility, horizontal axis measures the quantity of goods that you are buying, our utility curve looks like that. It's an upward sloping line. But notice that the slope of this line is changing. Do you all see that? If you remember your slope concept, you should notice that at each of these points, your slope is sort of going down, right? Do you all see that? The curve is sort of concave. Okay, what, what we can do now is we can now use the total utility numbers and from that table we can literally calculate the marginal utility figure. So let's see how we are calculating that. First of all, when you look at the zero quantity, your total utility is not well defined. There is no marginal utility. Um, when you are buying the first orange or first piano pizza, the extra utility that you get is 20. So your marginal utility from the first unit of pizza is 20 minus 0, that's 20. Uh, your marginal utility from the second pizza is 36 minus 20, that is 16, and you follow, right? Are we all clear on that? So marginal utility is the difference of utility between two units. When you are you buying the second unit of the pizza, marginal utility is total utility of the second pizza minus total utility of the first pizza. Do we all see that? Do we all see that? It is very important that we have a basic understanding about how to calculate marginal concepts. So we can calculate the marginal utility, the extra utility that you get by 
buying one extra unit of output. I uh, have those numbers in the second graph where your vertical axis now measures the uh, margin utility and your uh, you know, horizontal axis measures the quantity of goods that you buy. When you plug these numbers, this looks very much like a demand curve. Do you see that? The only difference between this and the demand curve is that in the demand curve, in the vertical axis, you measure price. Here in the vertical axis, you measure marginal utility. Okay? Both of these, uh, so either the slope of your total utility curve or the literal calculation of marginal utility and plugging that, plugging that in the second graph shows you that there is a direct application of the law of diminishing marginal utility in this case. As you buy more, your marginal utility is going down. That's what the slope of this marginal utility curve is telling you. That it's negative, meaning that as you buy more, your marginal utility goes down, and that's law of marginal, diminishing marginal utility. Okay, so with that idea, let us now move forward and ask even more critical questions. So now we have some idea about what utility is, what utility does. Utility is measuring our satisfaction. Uh, provided that we now have a way to measure our satisfaction, how are we going to use our income to satisfy that satisfaction, find that utility level? Okay. If our income was unlimited, if our income was unlimited, uh, we, none of us would be actually talking about this satisfaction concept, right? If our income was unlimited, we would buy whatever quantity of pizza we wanted to buy. If our income was unlimited, most of our problems would have been solved. Unfortunately, our problems are not solved because we have a scarcity of resources. Most importantly, our income is limited. <coughs> not only that, in reality, we really do not, do not buy only pizza. We also buy a lot of other stuff, it, like coal. So what we're going to do now is we are going to look at a very simple example where a consumer is not really thinking about buying only pizza, but also is thinking about buying coke at the same time. So he's thinking about buying two goods that are sort of complementary to each other, and he's thinking about how he will be able to allocate his resources, in this case his income. How can he use his income to get the best possible combination of these two goods that gives him the highest level of satisfaction? That is what our idea is. We're going to start this discussion with this idea called a budget constraint, something that we will look more rigorously in the next class. But a budget constraint is a very general idea. Budget constraint is a, is a general idea that every one of us face limited income. And the way to formalize that limited income is to say that every one of us have a budgetary problem. Our budget, the amount of money or the amount of income that we can allocate, allocate towards buying stuff is always constrained. That's why we call it a budget constraint. If there is a budget constraint, our decision about what we want to buy, and more importantly, what not to buy, becomes critically important. <clears throat> so, let's now first lay out the theory of how the concept of utility is going to help us to figure out how much of each good to buy, and then look at how that theory can be explained. The theory is very simple. What we're going to do, we are going to calculate something like this. For each of the goods that we are going to be considering buying, we are going to calculate first the marginal utility of each of the units of good X and find the price that we pay for each of these units of good X. X is an arbitrary good. And we take the ratio of those two. Before we move on, 
let us try to understand what this expression tells us. In the numerator of this expression, we have the marginal utility, a measurement of happiness or satisfaction that we get by buying one additional unit of that good. And on the denominator, we have the price of that good. So if you look at this ratio, you would realize that on the, the numerator is what you get by buying a good, and the denominator is what you pay to buy that good. Are we all clear on that? So if you look at this expression, this ratio, we can say that this ratio shows us a way that we can transform our money into our satisfaction. This ratio is a way to transform our income or money into <coughs> satisfaction. Do you all understand that? For each dollar we spend, this, is, this expression tells us how much you extra marginal utility we get. So that's why it is called marginal utility per dollar. And our theory says that if we are thinking about buying two goods, the marginal utility per dollar on these two goods have to be the same. The marginal utility per dollar for these two goods have to be the same. Meaning that the marginal utility do not have to be equal. Prices of these two goods do not need to be equal but the ratio of marginal utility per dollar has to be equal between these two goods. If we can do that, we can really get the maximum amount of satisfaction and that will solve our uh, budgetary problem. Okay? Before we move on, I want to you know, spend a little bit more time on this particular expression. Let's say I have two goods in my model and the goods are X and Y and um, this is the marginal utility per dollar on good X, this is the marginal utility per dollar on good Y and I'm saying that if I want to maximize my satisfaction, this is what I need to ensure that the, X, the last good that I'm buying on good Y the marginal utility per dollar on that unit of good Y has to be equal to the marginal utility of the last unit of good X that I'm buying and the marginal utility per dollar has to be equal to the marginal utility per dollar on good Y. If we can ensure that, notice that there is a very deep under, you know, concept here that is working on. When I am ensuring that the marginal utility per dollar on every good are equal, I am really getting something, an expression which you are going to see, see in a minute. It's called bang for the buck, which is, which, was, which is a very strange phrase for me. It took me a long time to really understand what that means. <laughs> so, from a... Consumer perspective, the idea is that different goods could be of different kind. One could be a pizza, the other one could be coke, one thing could be milk. And you really cannot get compare the satisfaction that you get from each of them. It's impossible. The prices of them are also different. The only way you can rationalize your purchasing power or purchasing decision is that you are going to ensure that this, this equality is ensured, this equality is maintained. And if this equality is maintained, notice you are doing something very, very deep. You are transforming your money on good Y in the same way you are transforming your money in good X. Do we all say that? These ratios are the way you are transforming your income into your satisfaction on each of these goods. And if these ratios are equal, that means the transformation, the way you are taking your income and somehow converting that into your satisfaction is equal across these goods. Okay, so that's the deep 
theoretical argument behind the stuff that we're going to look at in a minute. We're going to simplify this process. We're going to simplify this process by looking at numbers and, and by trying to crunch numbers. We, but numbers are not the basic idea of this chapter. So I hope that when you are preparing for this chapter, you go back to the video that is being recorded now uh, and try to understand this transformation process that I'm talking about. Okay? Let's now look at this transformation process in more, gray, or in more detail. We now have a very extensive table. Okay? So the table is give, trying to give you the... These are all made up numbers, but stay with us. So you have information about two goods that you are buying, Coke and Pepsi. And the first row gives you the number of slices of pizza that you can buy. The second column, the total utility that you can get. Margin utility is the extra utility that you get from each of the extra unit. Uh, then you move on to, so that's like the first part of the table. On the second part, you have number of, uh, you know, cokes, uh, total utility and marginal utility. So a lot of information. Okay, um, a lot of data. And the question is very simple. Given the information about total utility that you can get from Coke and that you get from pizza, how many slices of pizza are you going to buy and how many sli you know, cups of Coke you are going to buy? We want to understand how our consumer is going to make this very complicated decision. Notice we really don't know whether our consumer really likes pizza more than Pepsi or vice versa. These are obviously important considerations. Uh, the underlying assumption is that the consumer is indifferent between them, but he buys all of both of them because they are complementary good to him. We really don't know his specific preference for these two goods. Now, given that we have these numbers, given that we have these numbers, we will add the information about price. Pizza is two dollars. Uh, Coke is one dollar per cup, and we're going to take the marginal utility number on pizza. Divide that by the price of the pizza. And we are going to get this very critical <coughs> information about marginal utility per dollar. This particular column gives you the marginal utility per dollar on each of the units of pizza you buy. When you buy the fourth unit of pizza, the marginal utility per dollar is five. Meaning that you are able to transform each dollar of your income and you are getting five extra units of satisfaction. That's exactly <coughs> what this number is telling you. Are we all clear on this? Please take a moment to understand this number. Yes? Wouldn't it be uh, for four slices? Wouldn't it be just three and not five? I, I apologize. This is just I apologize. This is three, right? So uh, thank you for clarifying that. I was not looking at the numbers. So, when you are buying the fourth unit of pizza, your marginal utility per dollar is 6 divided by 2, 3. So, this tells you that when you are buying the fourth unit of pizza, you are using each dollar of your income and you are converting that to 3 units of satisfaction or utility. Okay? Now, the rule of thumb is that I would like to buy some specific quantity of Coke and specific quantity of pizza at which the marginal utility per dollar are equal between these two goods. The problem here is that there could be several different options. I'm going to delete these uh, specific colors because I will need all of them. So when you look at this table, you realize that this condition that we're talking about, the condition that marginal utility of pizza divided by the price of pizza has to be equal to the marginal <coughs> utility of coke divided by price of coke is satisfied at three different combinations. Let's use different colors to <coughs> highlight them. Notice that uh, the marginal utility per dollar of 10 is equal is happens in two different cases. When you are buying 
three cups of coke and one pizza. Do we all see that? That's one combination where marginal utility per dollar on pizza is equal to marginal utility per dollar on coke. That's only one. The second one is when you buy three units of pizza, your marginal utility per dollar is five, and when you buy four units of coke, your marginal utility is five as well. So that's also another combination where that equilibrium, where that ratio is satisfied. Are we all clear on that? The third one is when you buy four units, slices of pizza and you buy five units of coke. That's also a possibility where the marginal utility per dollar is the same. So we have just now seen that there are three possible combination of these two goods that can ensure that the marginal utility per dollar ratios are equal. So the question is, which one are you going to buy? Depends on how much money you have. That's a very, very good answer. And that's, that, that's not a trivial, that was not a trivial question. That was not a trivial question and that's a very smart answer. We're going to look at that, that answer in detail. But are we all clear on the question? And are we all clear on the possibilities that we have? We now have three possibilities, all of which can satisfy our so-called equilibrium conditions. Now, equilibrium conditions are important only when it satisfies your objective, right? So in our market equilibrium, we were finding equilibrium that gave us something that we wanted. Our objective was to get an equilibrium pri a price that both the buyer and the seller agrees and a quantity that the buyer and the seller wanted to trade. Our objective here is to maximize our utility. Our objective here is to satisfy, maximize our level of satisfaction. So the question that we are going to now look at, does this, this so-called you know, marginal utility per dollar really maximize our level of satisfaction? So let's look at that. We have enough information to verify that. OK, um, I'm going to come back to the argument at the uh, top of this slide uh, later on. Let's just focus on the numbers for the time being. As I just mentioned, that there are three possible combination of goods that you can buy that can satisfy the marginal utility per dollar being equal condition. One is when you buy one slice of pizza and three cups of Coke. The other one is three slices of pizza and four Coke. The third one is four pizza and five Coke. Each of them, in each of cases, the marginal utility per dollar is different. We all see that. But they are equal across the two goods. The important part of this table is the next two columns. Let's look at that. The first one is that these combinations that we have just identified that are possible candidates to maximize our satisfaction have different level of cost, right? We know their price. Pizza is $2, Coke is one. So for the first bundle, the cost of the bundle is two times one. That's the cost on pizza. Uh, three times, sorry, uh, two times one, that's the cost on one slice of pizza. And three times one, that's the cost on three units of Coke. So the cost is five. The cost on the second combination is 10, and the cost on the second, third combination is 13. So we have just seen that although these three are possible con candidates that can maximize our satisfaction or g help us to get an equilibrium, the cost is very different, right? 5, 10, and 13. The associated utility which is the total utility. This is the utility that you get by buying one Coke, uh, one pizza and three Coke. So utility associated, total utility associated with the second bundle, total utility associated with the third bundle. The total utility numbers are also different. So we have just found out that w this three combination of goods that can satisfy our so-called marginal utility per dollar costs different and gives you different levels of satisfaction, total satisfaction. So the question is, which one are you going to choose? Which one are you going to choose?
first one. Appreciate the highest marginal utility per dollar. Why do you really care about a highest marginal utility per dollar? You, what, what you care, and please, be, uh, please remember our objective. Our objective is to maximize our satisfaction. And we can see clearly that the bundle that maximizes our satisfaction is this one. Because it's the largest, it gives you the largest total utility. Total utility is the total level of satisfaction. But that also is the most expensive one too. Do you all see that? This is where we see the importance of scarcity, right? The table just told you that in order to get more, in order to get more satisfaction, you also have to spend more money, which kind of a per makes perfect sense, right? <coughs> so if somebody asks you, which bundle would our consumer be willing to buy, willing to buy, we would probably say this one, right? Because that one is giving our consumer the highest level of satisfaction. But the next question is even more important. Which one do you think our consumer will be able to buy? Wanting to buy and being able to buy are not the same thing. We can, we can want to buy a lot of things, right? But the problem is that, and the reality of the fact, is that our choices are always constrained by our income, by our budget constraints. So the answer to the second question, which is very, very important, is that our consumer will choose these different combinations based on how much income he or she has. If our consumer has an income of $5, you can see clearly that our consumer cannot you know, afford this more expensive bundle. Do you all see that? So the answer, which was given to, uh, to by one of your colleagues, is that our decision to buy different combination will be constrained by our income. If we have $5 income, this is the bundle that I'm going to buy. If my income is 10, this is the bundle that I'm going to buy. If my income is 13, I will buy a bundle where my utility is maximized, 105. And the bundle is very different. So, by using the concept of utility and the important idea that uh, we have a budget constraint, we can combine these two ideas and we can see how our consumer, within the constraint of his budget, maximizes his or her total utility. By using those conditions, by equating marginal utility per dollar across different goods, finding a budget, finding a combination of goods that are within their budget, and that gives them a corresponding utility level. So as your income increases, notice, as your income increases, you, your total utility sort of goes up, and that makes sense, right? But the marginal utility case is a different one. I want to uh, pause for one minute and see whether you have any question related to what we have just covered. Yes, please. So, notice that we have chosen these three combination of goods based on equ equating the marginal utility per dollar, right? Notice that when we were trying to compare the marginal utility per dollar being 10, there is one combination of good for which the marginal utility per dollar is 10. When you are buying one, Slice of pizza, and when you're buying three units of coke. Do you all see that? So that is a combination where your marginal utility per dollar are equal and equal to 10. The second combination was when you are buying three units of coke, pizza, and four units of coke. In which case, the marginal utility per dollar were same across the two goods, and they were equal to five. In the third case, you are buying four units of pizza and five units of coke, the marginal utility per dollar, were three across these two goods. And that, so these three options really satisfy the marginal utility per dollar being equal constant, you know, condition. So what was the equilibrium condition? We said that the equilibrium condition is where the marginal utility per dollar 
on the two goods or on so many goods that you buy has to be equal across, right? And we have just found three different options that can satisfy that. After we identified those three options, we I, I highlighted them in the first column. We looked at their total cost, how much it requires you to pay for them, and we looked at their corresponding total level of satisfaction. We, based on our calculation, we have found that which bundle you are going to buy at the end really depends on your income level. If your income level is low, you are going to buy uh, you know, a combination of goods, which is one slice of pizza and three cups of coke. That really allows you to stay within your budget, right? If your income increases, you are going to buy something else. And that makes perfect sense. So this accounts for a lot of different things that we really cannot talk about in this principal level course. One of the fact being that in, a, in an economy, everyone is different, by the way. And this idea, and everyone has different level of income, everyone has different <coughs> level of satisfaction that they get from oranges, or Coke from Coke, or from pizza. And this concept really, really, you know, ignores those differences. It says that as long as we are able to maintain this marginal utility per dollar across the goods, we are all going to be fine. We all will be able to maximize our satisfaction and, 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 and buy the goods that we want to buy. Okay. Does that answer, did that answer your question? Was, did that, okay. Any other question? Okay, now what we want to do is I'm going to use this blank space to talk a little bit about the questions that are going to be in your exam. Okay? So first, imagine that for the time being we have a condition which looks like this. I have two goods, X and Y, general goods, and I have already as in a, uh, being able to maintain the marginal utility per dollar situation, so I am in equilibrium, I am, I am good. Now, I am seeing that the price of the good is, oh, sorry, sorry, let, I apologize. I want to first consider a different situation. Let's imagine, for the time being, that we don't have the equilibrium condition, but we have a situation where this is happening. What do I do? What should I do in this case? Okay. <laughs> That's true, by the way. Um, so, what is this inequality telling us? This inequality is telling us that the the way you are transforming your money in buying <coughs> X is giving you more utility than the transformation from Y, right? It appears that good X per dollar is giving you more utility. Do you all see that? Which means that probably you should buy more of good X, right? Make sense? But there is a problem. It doesn't make sense. No, we're good. Okay. So if you buy more of good X, there is a catch. What's the catch? Very good. That's a, that's a very good answer. We won't be able to cover the point that you just mentioned, but we will do that in the next class. So, that's a, there's a, there, it's true that there is a trade-off between, because if you buy more of good X, you're going to buy less of good Y, right? <coughs> Let's divide this two part, the argument into two parts. Let's just focus on what happens when you buy more of good X. What happens when you buy more of good X? What happens to this ratio? On what? So when this, equal, this inequality is happening, let's write down the conditions. You buy more X, 
and if you buy more x marginal utility of x goes down and if this goes down you can see that it could actually lead to an equilibrium between these two do you all see that but then there is something else happening as was just mentioned by him when you buy more x your income is limited so you buy less y right at the same time when you buy less y marginal utility of y goes up isn't that right Law of diminishing marginal utility says that when you buy more of something, marginal utility goes down. Which means that if you buy less of something, marginal utility goes up. Are we all clear on that? So, what you are seeing here are two things happening at the same time. Marginal utility of X goes down, marginal utility of Y goes up, which also is consistent with the fact that the left hand side is slowly going to go down, Right hand side is slowly going to go up and we have an equilibrium. This question in some variations will be in your exam. So what I have just done, I have just told you one question that will be in your exam. Thank you very much. On Wednesday we are going to pick this up and we are going to cover the remaining part of what we want to cover from this chapter.